Hello everybody, welcome back to Rebel Science. This is Genome Toolkit, part three, building statistical data. We're gonna be adding a new algorithm to our Genome Toolkit, KMER Frequency Algorithm, to help us to build that statistical data around some KMERs in genomes. So biologists often use KMERs to identify patterns or motifs in genomic sequences, such as repeated patterns or conserved regions. In genomics, a conserved region refers to a sequence of nucleotides that is highly similar or even identical in some cases between species and organisms. So one example of where this might be useful is in the analysis of transcription factors binding sites. Transcription factors, as you can see, are proteins that bind to specific DNA sequences and regulate gene expression. By identifying most frequent KMERs using our algorithm, biologists can identify potential binding sites for transcription factors and study how those sites are regulated in different cell types and under different conditions. Biologists can use KMER analysis to identify conserved sequences across different species. This can help them understand the evolutionary relationship between different organisms. So before we start implementing this very simple yet very powerful algorithm, let's take a look at a few slides and this should give you a good idea how this algorithm can actually help us, okay? So if we use our previous algorithm called KMER count, right? We pass a sequence and we pass a KMER we want to find in that sequence. So in this example, we have our sequence and we have a KMER AA and we're searching for that KMER and we can see that it appears three times. It's uh, noted in AA red. And then we can search for CT and we can see that CT repeats twice. So if we give that algorithm our sequence and those two KMERs, those are the results three and two. Now, what happens if we don't know the KMER we need to search for? It's a huge genomic sequence. We need to find some patterns, but we don't know what we need to search for. Okay, this is where the frequency algorithm comes into play. So we can say, here's our sequence. We're going to be using the same sequence. And let's find the most frequent KMERs in that sequence. So we're going to be, again, reusing the sequence. And we're telling it, hey, can you find the most frequent KMER of the length 2? And of course, it returns a A, because that's the sequence of length 2, the KMER of length 2, that repeats in that sequence the most, three times. And then we're telling it, can you also find a KMER of length 3, and if you look at the sequence, AAC is the most frequent KMER of length 3, okay? So now we have at least a set of KMERs we can try searching for in different genomes. So the next step we could do is, okay, we have a set of KMERs AA and AAC. Now we can search for this set of KMERs in multiple genomes using our faster count KMERs algorithm. So we don't have to search for the most frequent KMERs in every single genome. We can use one and we can search for the same set of KMERs across different genomes. And here are just four examples of random genomes. Those are not real genomes, just an example of a frog, cat, dog, and a crow. And we can see that we found the same kind of patterns in all of those genomes. And this should definitely help biologists to find similarities in different genomes, okay? So now that we've seen how we can use two algorithms to help each other, we can use the most frequent KMER algorithm to generate a set of KMERs from one genome and then apply that uh, set of KMERs to count KMERs and search for the same KMERs in a lot of different genomes. So how does this help us? This actually is a bioinformatics pipeline example. Even though it's just two very simple algorithms, that's already a small pipeline. So the first step is to use the slower algorithm to find frequent KMERs in just one genome. So find most frequent KMERs is the algorithm that we're going to be using. And the second step is search for the same set of KMERs in other genomes using the faster algorithm, count KMERs, to find the common transcription factors, common genes, etc. So yes, find most frequent KMER is a bit slower algorithm, and we can use a faster algorithm count KMERs together with that algorithm. We're actually going to come back to this slide again when we implement the algorithm, so it's even more clear. Let's go back to our code. So we are back in our code. This is the algorithm we've added last time, count KMERs, and here's our application. And let's just run it as we always do to make sure it works. And maybe we can change that to search for double A KMER, and we can see that this algorithm works. And we can actually remove our site panel so we have more space. So before we actually start implementing our new algorithm, I want to start by updating the way we will be writing comments and documentation in our algorithms. We will be using extended doc strings. 
If you have completed DNA Toolkit series, you should be familiar with doc strings. They are comments written in a triple quotes. We can actually see here, we are using a doc string, but it's just a one line doc string. A doc string can include information about parameters, return values, and any special considerations around our algorithm. So we're gonna start by just updating the doc string comments for our existing algorithm. I'm going to replace it with this. And you can see that it contains a lot of information. Even though this algorithm is quite simple, it still is very useful to have those uh, comments because someone might be using your genome toolkit by importing that into their project and they just want to see what the algorithm does by just coming here and pointing at the algorithm and it gives them all of the information. They don't have to go in and kind of read and try to understand. It says it counts the number of times specific k-mer appears in a given sequence including overlapping k-mers. That's already a very important bit of information. It says that overlapping k-mers are supported by our algorithm. It also explains the parameters, which is a string and a kamer, and what it returns. If the algorithm is way more complex, and let's say it returns a dictionary or a list, and there's some specific type of information in the dictionary or a list, we can of course explain it in results. So this dictionary contains keys and values and what those keys and values are. Okay, so now we can come back here. So this is going to be our old algorithm that we added in the last video and we have updated the doc strings. So now it's time to actually start adding our new algorithm. So the way we're going to do it, we're going to add an empty algorithm first and we can start kind of breaking it down into four parts. So this algorithm will have very simple four parts and we're going to add one by one and explain them, okay? So because we're going to be using the new type of documentation for our algorithms, we can actually do that as our first step. Also, this helps you to design your algorithm. You can add this doc string and kind of explain what you want from this algorithm. So what is the input and what is the expected output? And based on that, you can start designing your code, okay? So this one is going to find the most frequent camera of a given length in a DNA string. And the parameter is gonna be a sequence, of course, and the length of the camera, which is also integer. And we should be getting back a list of most frequent cameras in a DNA string. So what could be our first step? So the first step is we need a dictionary to store our frequent k-mers. So this is how we're going to do that. We're going to say, hey, I need a dictionary to store k-mer frequencies. It's an empty dictionary. Okay, that's a simple step. So now that we have our dictionary, we need a for loop to loop through the sequence we're passing to this algorithm and actually add our k-mers to that dictionary and their frequency. So a loop that iterates through a DNA string and extracts the k-mers of a given length while also incrementing the frequency of these k-mers. So this loop just scans through a slice of the string based on, of course, on the length of the k-mer. And this part, if else, just increments the frequency of the camera. So this line says, okay, our camera is not yet in the dictionary. So we're gonna set it to one because it appears the first time, so one. Okay, now we're gonna keep looping. And if we come across the same camera again, it's going to say, okay, this camera already exists in our dictionary. So we should add one to the count. So if it was one before, now we're seeing it yet again, we're gonna be making it two and so on. If we see it four times, it's going to be four, okay? So that's very simple. Again, we have our dictionary where we're gonna store our k-mers and their frequencies. We have a simple for loop that uses the length of the sequence and the length of a k-mer to grab the k-mers from our sequence. And then it makes a decision. Is it already in a dictionary? If yes, just add one to its occurrence. If not, add it to our dictionary and set it to one. Okay. Okay. So we added our two steps out of four. We need our third step. We need a way to look in the dictionary and find the highest value in a dictionary. And of course, the highest value is going to be our camer that is repeated in that sequence the most. So we need a variable to store the maximum value in the dictionary. So we're going to call it highest frequency. And we are using the max function, max method. This is a built-in Python method, of course, and we are just giving it camer frequency. And of course, we're not just giving a dictionary, we're saying explicitly, we want to look in the values of that dictionary, not in keys and values, just the values, which are our integers, these numbers, okay? So it's going to return the highest frequency, which is just a number, an integer. Okay, so this is easy so far. We need to add our last step. 
now we have our highest frequency, which is an integer, and we have our dictionary. How about we just loop through that dictionary and search for the highest value in it, and then we return the kamer that has the highest value. We can do that with just a return function like this, and we are using a list comprehension. We're saying we want to loop through this Kamer frequency dictionary and specifically items because that's how you work with dictionaries when you loop through them. You loop through their items and the items are of course keys and values. So we're just gonna return Kamer. We don't care about the frequency. So we are saying, can we loop through this? Okay. And we're gonna return Kamer and the frequency, but we're gonna make sure that if the frequency is equals to this highest value, only then return that Kamer. And it's going to accumulate those Kamers. We can actually remove this pass now, okay? We actually split that into four lines, so it fits. We can actually do this all in one line, which is not as pretty, of course. You can always break it down in multiple lines, so it's way more readable like that, okay? Let's now go back to our application and add another print so we can test our algorithm. And of course, we're going to be using f-strings. And this is going to be our most frequent kamer. And we're going to call our gt, which is genome toolkit, and we can see that it now has two algorithms. And we can pass our sequence, we're not going to change the sequence we're going to be using, and the Kamer length, we can actually implement this right here. We're going to say, we want to search for Kamer length 2, and if you think about it, it should return AA, because that's definitely the most frequent Kamer. Okay, so now that we have our new output added, let's execute it, and we can see that the most frequent Kamer algorithm returned AA, and it's indeed the most frequent Kamer of the length Two, okay, so you can try playing around with the sequence and the camera lens to actually maybe predict what the output is going to be before you execute it. So if we say three, you might think, okay, so maybe this is going to be the output, but no, because there are no most frequent cameras of length three, they're all different. It's going to return a big list. So this is going to be our first value. This is going to be a second value, third, and so on. Let's try executing our code now. And you can see just split the sequence in the lens of three kamers and return the whole list. Again, this is because there is no most frequent kamer. They are all most frequent kamers. So let's do another quick experiment. Let's add another nucleotide A to our sequence and predict what the output is going to be. Of course, repeats found is going to be four because we just added another A nucleotide. And there is now four pairs of AA. But the kamer, most frequent kamer one is going to return... AAA, because now we have a most frequent kamer, which is AAA and AAA. And because we're looking for a lens three most frequent kamer, this is the most frequent kamer of lens AA. And now let's try running this. And here is our output. So now we can add another quick test for our algorithm to see if it will find two most frequent kamers of lens three. Let's actually do the same to TT. So now the output should be TTT AAA. Okay, let's do that. And this is correct. So we can see that our algorithm actually works and produces correct results. As we've seen before in our previous video, part 2.1, sometimes there are bugs in our algorithms which are really hard to find. So in our next video, we're going to actually add a set of tests to our genome toolkit. So anytime we change our algorithms, we can rerun the set of tests to make sure that the output are still correct and our algorithms produce correct results. Now let's go back to our algorithm and you can see that we used a dictionary and a simple for loop to solve this algorithm. There are multiple ways you can approach this algorithm. One of them could be using counters from collections module, but I'm gonna leave that to you to experiment. See if you can solve this algorithm in a different way. Okay, if you want to see an example of how this is solved with counters, it will be included in the article version of this video. You can see the example there. Okay, so let's now summarize. Kamer frequency is very useful for a variety of purposes in genomics and biology. One of them could be identifying potential regulatory elements within a genome, understanding the evolutionary relationship between different species, analyzing transcription factor binding sites and gene regulation, or identifying conserved sequences across different species. Overall, Kamer frequency analysis is a valuable tool for biologists looking to build a statistical data and identify patterns or motifs within a genome. It has numerous applications in genomics and biology and can provide valuable insights into the structure and function of genomic sequences.
So now let's come back to our slides. They should make more sense now that we have our algorithm implemented. So we can use Kmer count to search for specific Kmers in a genome. If we don't know what we need to search for, we can use our Kmer frequency algorithm on one of the genomes, or maybe two genomes or three genomes, to build a list of most frequent Kmers, and then we can search for those Kmers in other genomes, okay? And again, this was a good example of a small bioinformatics pipeline. However, it is important to know that this is still a very naive approach, as it does not take into account mutations in DNA known as single nucleotide polymorphisms, SMPs for short, right? Since a given Kmer can appear in other genome sequences with a slight mutation due to SNP, just one nucleotide is different. Our algorithm will not be able to detect it. In the future videos and articles, we will expand our algorithms to take these types of mutations into account in order to more accurately analyze and compare genomic sequences. Overall, the use of Kmer frequencies and Kmer count algorithm can be useful starting point for analyzing genome sequences. But it is important to consider the limitations of these approaches and continue to develop and refine our methods as needed. Before we close today, I want to give a huge shout out to Joyce Shi for the amazing PayPal donation and Joshua for the ongoing Patreon support. Your donations are truly appreciated and make a big difference in helping the Rebel Science Project grow and improve. Your support is motivating and much appreciated. Every dollar and every donation helps the project grow. And I'm grateful for your generosity. Thank you for your support. And as always, you can follow Rebel Science on all of these social medias, and you should join Telegram and Matrix communities. The article versions, which are more detailed, can be found on rebelscience.club and Medium platforms. Until next time, Rebel Coder, signing out.